Good evening. In the next 45 minutes, around a thousand unsuspecting viewers are going to discover they know something the police badly need to know. Almost a third of the crimes we're about to show you will be solved because of calls tonight. After 13 years, Crime Watch has covered 1,606 cases, which have led to 493 arrests, 45 of them for murder. As you must have seen from the papers, London has had a spate of truly appalling rapes in the last few months. The most notorious, of course, that of an Austrian tourist who was attacked by a gang of little more than children. And in that case, the boys have now been convicted. But tonight, a case that remains unsolved. Two months ago, in the afternoon of Friday, March the 7th, a Swedish nurse was confronted by a man as she arrived home at her flat in Earl's Court in West London. The assailant was armed with a knife. He's thought to be in his late 20s or early 30s. He's about six feet tall, of athletic, slim build, with very short, black, curly hair, and he's described as having light brown skin. Now, the victim screamed so loudly, the man took fright and ran away. But it's thought the same man may be responsible for rape in at least one other similar attack. And this is the woman who is the victim of the second episode, and despite all the trauma of it all, she's decided she wants to appeal on Crime Watch directly, live now, to help make sure that there are no future victims. Her attack took place on Saturday the 5th of April at about 10.35pm. And you volunteered to appear on this programme, which takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage, in fact, to go to the police in the first place. What do you say to women who've been raped by this man or intimidated by him, who, 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 feel, it's sh sh who feel ashamed, haven't gone to the police? I don't think they should feel ashamed. And police were very kind and um, taking care of me. And I think they should come forward to help to catch him. It seems quite possible this man will have offended several times before. Mm -hmm. What do you remember most about him? What would other women, other potential victims remember? He was very nervous at the time and he was quite um, tall and he was wearing red jacket and he wasn't rough at all. He wasn't rough and he was nervous, so this isn't a sort of great macho man we're looking for. This is somebody who's got a certain lack of self-confidence, maybe. Yeah, I think so. P Peter Johnson, you're coordinating both these inquiries. Obviously, you need other women who, who might think they know, who might have been approached by him to call in. Who else can help? Well, absolutely. I'm, we're not 100% certain that these attacks have been committed by the same person, but there's a number of significant similarities. I think, firstly, that they were both attacked at home. He used a knife and on both occasions he took credit card and cash. He also demanded their PIN numbers. The first attack took place on the 7th of March in Nevin Square and the second in Phil Beach Gardens on the 5th of April. Now this is an area which is very close to uh, where the Ideal Home Exhibition was on at the time. The That's Oxford right. Exhibition Centre. Might have been people there from all over the United Kingdom and from abroad. Well, yes, it's a stone's throw from the Oscourt exhibition, and at that time of night it's also very busy. So we are appealing for any witnesses who may have seen this man either before or after any of the attacks. Incidentally, this is a man who, for the first attack, wasn't at work at 3.30pm on a Friday, which, which may be some sort of clue. He, he went to cash points in the area, which may also be a, a, a clue. Explain the pattern of those. Yes, after the first attack, he went to the Barclays Bank at Knightsbridge very quickly, where he withdrew some money. And on the second attack, we've estimated he ran from Phil Beach Gardens to Earls Court Road, where he withdrew £250 from the National Westminster Bank. And finally, he tried again at Willesden sometime after midnight. Well, if that pattern in any way makes sense to you, if you think you know who this man is, please don't hesitate. 0500 600 600, the free call number live here to detectives and to BBC researchers. If you prefer, you can call the instant room on the Earls Court Road in West London, 0181. 0181-246-0711. And now tonight's first reconstruction. Three months ago, we made a brief appeal about a tragedy that marked the start of 1997. The victim was Nicola Dixon from Sutton Coldfield. Well, our first appeal produced a lot of well-intentioned calls, but sadly nothing to identify the killer. Tonight, we hope a reconstruction will jog more memories and maybe help one or two people with their conscience. Morning, about nine o'clock or so on Sunday morning, and um, she was on the doorstep. She said, "Aren't you going to wish me good luck for the driving test, Dad?" <sighs> and I said, "She wouldn't need it. She would pass anyway." 
Because of Nicola's driving test, her parents left her at home while they went to visit relatives in Northumberland, but she had close friends to go to. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Have a good one. Mm. Come on, Dad, we haven't got all year. Okay, smile. Smiling. She was just really nice and she was my best friend. I didn't ever think she was going to go away like she did. <laughs> New Year? Yeah! We were both going to go out with different people well, and until after, after New Year and then we'd meet up at two at Nicola's house. Yeah, fine. But I've got to go. Um, I'll leave the keys outside the house somewhere. Yeah, just chuck them in the snow and I'll find them when it thaws. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> See you in 97 then. God, yeah, 97. <laughs> Have a brilliant time. Yeah. <laughs> At 8 o'clock on New Year's Eve, Nicola joined a group celebration at the Good Hope Social Club, but apart from one close friend, she barely knew the others. She just seemed really happy that, you know, it was the first time that she hadn't been going out with anybody and that she could enjoy New Year to herself. She had a thing about dancing, and I'm not a dancer, <laughs> and she was trying to, like, bribe us all into dancing. Carly, I'm going to go now. Are you sure you'll be okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll be fine. Do you want to come with no, you? I'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Happy New Year. Yeah. When she left, I was a bit surprised, you know. I mean, it's quite expensive to get a ticket in there. I don't know, maybe she was bored. In fact, Nicola had arranged to meet some other friends at the station pub and left to walk there at roughly 10pm. There are several ways of getting there, but all involve walking down towards the town centre. Were you in Sutton Coldfield on New Year's Eve? And if so, did you see anyone resembling Nicola? In particular, were you at the junction of Rectory Road and Coles Hill Street at around 20 past 10? One couple who were seen here have not yet been identified. I would have said that they were, were both definitely under 25. He had dark, wavy hair. It was an untrendy hairstyle. He was slightly taller than her, with bomber jacket done right up to the top. I was keeping an eye out because New Year's Eve, if you're going to get your car stolen, that's the time you're going to get it stolen. Just up the road, another resident heard footsteps in the snow. I saw this man running down Colesill Street towards the entrance of Derricott's premises. Nothing unusual. It's hard to give you a reason why I went out on that evening. I just felt uneasy. He saw a white man, five foot ten, with light brown hair and in his early twenties. Could it have been you? I thought, what an idiot making that row. Because I'm a mechanic, I recall the car quite well. It was a Mark II Fiesta, dark blue or royal blue. It had oversized wheels and it had a wide bore exhaust. The clock was really loud, so you could always hear it on, on the air. So I kept awake and at four it woke me up again. And I was becoming really concerned. Went upstairs to see if she was there and she still wasn't back. I tried to ring on New Year's Day in the morning. Several times I kept getting my own voice on the answer phone and I couldn't understand why. It, it was unlike Nicola because she would have been trying to get a meal ready for us, trying to find out what time we'd be back. And we actually drove back past Trinity Church on the way home and we saw all the police cars then. And then we got home a minute later and the police car was waiting outside. There was a police car parked outside at the bottom of our garden and it, we knew obviously it just had to be connected. It, it wasn't there by accident. Of course, what we did here was far worse than we could have ever really have imagined at all. Nicola had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. 
Well, the man leading this tragic inquiry is uh, Detective Chief Inspector Kelvin Roberts. It's four and a half months since Nicola died. Who are you hoping to appeal to tonight? Four and a half months is a long time for the family, obviously, but it must be an awful long time for the person who's, who's killed Nicola. The stress upon them must be tremendous, and I find it hard to believe that they haven't spoken to somebody about it, confided, or somebody who, close to them hasn't realised that they're acting differently. And it's that sort of person we want to come forward and help us tonight. Now, this happened on New Year's Eve, bound to jog a lot of memories, because most people remember what they were doing that day, of course. That's right. It's made, been very easy for us to say to people, what we're we doing New Year's Eve. And, of course, we can't ignore the fact that people People have been coming into Sutton Coldfield for parties and that sort of thing. So people who don't normally live there, they may well have seen something that they, they don't realise is significant to us. And again, we know those need those people to come forward. Let's go into a bit more detail of into those uh, sightings. The couple seen on Trinity Hill, first of all. Why are they particularly significant to your inquiry? Well, we know Nicola left the social club at about 10 o'clock. So 10.20 is a realistic time for her to have got to Trinity Hill at uh, Rectory Road. So I can't rule out the possibility that this couple, Nicola, was one of them. They haven't come forward. We've done national and local publicity. They still haven't come forward. So clearly it is now very important that if they recognise the description, they do come forward. If they're having an affair of something like that, I'm not interested. I just need them to come forward so I can eliminate them. Now the girl does fit Nicola's description. She had long dark hair, was wearing a dark jacket. So it's very important that we know what the man looked like. That's right. The man is about 25, probably a bit under 25. He had dark wavy hair, which is described as untrendy. He was wearing a black bomber jacket and he had stone blue jeans. Now the man seen by several witnesses running down Coles Hill Street, that could be the same man. Well, it could be, uh, but we were not yeah, definitely linking the, uh, the two people. Yeah. But it is a significant time. It's about 20 minutes after we believe Nicola may have been at the corner. He was seen running down the street. Right. And, of course, the screams have been heard a, a bit earlier. So it is very important that we trace this man. And what did he look like? He was about 5 foot 10 inches tall. He'd got a bomber jacket on as well, a dark coloured one, and he'd got jeans on. More relevantly, of course, you can link him to a car because one witness was very definite, wasn't he? Very observant about the sort of car that boy was driving. That's right. Uh, it's important that people try and link this man with a car. The car is described by one witness as a boxy, old type of car, but by another witness, he's quite certain it was a Mark II Ford Fiesta, uh, an old one. And unusually with that car, most of the cars that we've seen are registered owners, in fact, are women owners. So what I'd say is that any women who've lent their car out, it was in free pay, anything like that, please think, could that driver you recognise that driver to your car. Kelvin Roberts, thank you very much. We're appealing to a lot of consciences tonight. In fact, the local community around Sutton Coalfield really, really does want someone caught in this case. They've put up a reward totalling £23,000. So, if you think you know who was responsible, if you've heard anything on the grapevine, if you saw anything that, with hindsight, might be linked to Nicola's murder, you can reach us here. Please call. We're live. The number is 0500 600 600, and it's free. There are more detectives waiting in the incident room, if you prefer to call there, on Birmingham 0121. 322-6104. That's Birmingham, 322-6104. And now Superintendent David Hatcher. With some city centre television, that's the electronic eye that helps to do what good neighbours do naturally, keep a look out for the community. Now this is Slater Street in the heart of Liverpool, just after 2 o'clock in the morning of Wednesday the 23rd of April. Some lads have just emerged from a club, and one of them still carrying a bottle. There's clearly trouble brewing. We won't show you the violence that ensued, but can you help identify these two young men? First, this one in the hooped shirt. He's about 27 or 28, with dark hair and medium build. And this one is much younger, 16 to 18. He's slim, with light brown hair. Take a good look at them. One of their victims had savage injuries and needed 40 stitches, and is likely to be permanently disfigured. Please call us now on 0500 600 600 or call Merseyside Police on 0151 777 4051. That's Liverpool 777 4051. One of last month's reconstructions stirred up a huge reaction and it prompted over 300 viewers to ring the studio with information. We showed sightings of a man who raped a schoolboy in rural Essex, a crime that was scientifically linked to another male rape in Suffolk. Some 50 names were generated from the programme, and half of those have still to be eliminated. Incidentally, it's now thought that the rapist may not be openly gay, even though these are plainly homosexual attacks. 
There's been a charge on a murder, that of Jan Polak, much of it down to a sharp-eyed police officer who went home to watch a video of Crime Watch and recognised the suspect as someone he thought he'd seen that day. Well, the man is now awaiting trial for murder. And a man is now awaiting trial for armed robbery after viewers linked him to a raid on a bank in Suffolk that we featured in our programme back in February. Three people have been arrested for deceptions and three others have been charged for a robbery, robbery in London's New Bond Street, which we featured back in December 1995. And now Detective Constable Jackie Hames. If you've ever had your purse or wallet stolen, you'll know how distressing it is and what a hassle it can be. Maybe this man was responsible. He's been caught on security cameras all round England, presenting stolen credit cards at building societies and bureau de change. A sort of Cook's tour around the country. Indeed, he's tried co conning Thomas Cook's as well. If you know him, call us now. Here's the number, 0500 600 600. That's a free call here to the studio live. Or call the incident room in Chichester. That's on 01243 520230. That's Chichester 520230. And ring in two if you know these two. This couple's on a spending spree at a shopping centre in North London, buying electrical goods and children's clothing, but they're using someone else's credit cards. They were stolen from an elderly woman. He's in his early 30s, medium build, and possibly from Ghana or Kenya. He's, she's probably late 20s, 0500 600 600, or call Thames Valley Police on 01296 396 000. That's 01296 396 000. Next, a reconstruction. It takes place late at night in the Marlowe's Shopping Centre in Hemel Hempstead, Hertfordshire, and it centres on one Wednesday night, about two months ago. A couple of months ago I got a job at our local video store, which is really good, I really do enjoy it. It gives you the, the freedom to go out, um, buy your own clothes, do your own thing, um, just generally enjoy yourself. It was my 16th birthday and me and my friend had been downtown shopping and we met some people in Sainsbury's and we were sort of talking to them for a little while and we said we'd meet them later. They ain't coming are they? Yeah. What time is it? It's gone 10.30. I told you we should have taken the bus. Don't blame me. Yeah, well, it's your idea to chat them up in the first place. Great birthday, I'm having. Stay that geezer over there. It's a right looking weirdo. He was wearing a long jacket, just swaying, really, like he'd just come out of the pub or something. Thought he was weird, I didn't like the look of him at all. Don't know. You miss one? Yeah, well, your side's a mess. Yeah, but I'm in charge. You going out? You'll be lucky, you've got college in the morning. Lazy. Yeah. There's that bloke again. Just me the creeps. I'm just ignore him. They weren't the only ones suspicious of him. The Marlowe's shopping centre has 24 hour surveillance, and the operators noticed the gaunt man and someone else who may have approached him for a light. Who is that sitting there? He's in his late twenties and with a grey woolen hat. It's now 11.32 p.m. on Wednesday the 19th of March. And now a minute later, just outside Marks and Spencer. As we walked past, he said, evening ladies. I just lifted my hand just to say, go away, leave us alone. And carried on walking. He's following us, you see? Yeah. Well, don't look at him then. Come on, let's walk a bit faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who told you that one then? Oh, that's terrible. Oh, you good. You don't do any more, do you? No. We set the alarm, checked both the doors, and waited for the alarm to turn off with our box of rubbish to be put in the bin. Right, that's it. Okay. Bye. Oh, see you later. See you later. See you later. And I was really panicking. 
So my friend said to me, sit down, I still knew it was there. So I was getting pretty worried and felt really uncomfortable with it. That's when I saw this other young girl and he was just behind her. I thought, that poor girl, because my natural instinct was that something was going to happen to her and something was going to happen and it would be bad. And I, as he walked past, I looked up. He had a very thin face with high cheekbones, long nose. He looked broken. Early 20s, something like that. But um, my friend seemed pretty relaxed about it. I thought I was being silly. At that time, I was walking rather quickly, which I normally do when I get to the subway because, like, home's just two minutes away. I was getting really conscious now because the bloke was so close and just reaching the entrance to the actual subway. I heard footsteps running behind me and before I knew it his hand was round my neck and I just really didn't know what to do so I screamed and screamed and thank god it was like in an echoey place. It's that girl. No, it's not. It's just a kid. It is her. It is her. She's being attacked. Quick, get help. I didn't think those two girls could hear me. Um, I didn't think nobody could hear me. I just thought I was going to be left here. And I just thought I was going to die. As soon as I was on the floor, I knew that he was going to rape me, or try to, but... Um, so I just kept on screaming and screaming, and nobody was there. Help! For God's sake, open the door! No one's answering. Hi! There's a girl in the subway, she's being attacked, she's being raped, you've got to help her! Come calm down, calm but down. she's still down there. Well, you stay there. You stay there. Well, I've got a shock of my life then. Good God, you know. You, you don't sort of expect these things to happen near home, like, do you? Oi. And I looked along the subway, I could see the two figures struggling at the far end. The would be rapist ran off across St Albans Road towards the Bennett's End estate. I've got to get home. Do you want to speak to the station? No, my dad will do that. You're all right, <laughs> if it hadn't been for those three people, I really don't know whether I would be here now. Because he tried to shut me up and I wouldn't. I just wanted to get get out of there. Nigel Hurst here was a man who was, was reckless, didn't mind being seen, absolutely determined to find a victim. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised if he hadn't done something like this before. He seemed determined to commit an offence that night. He'd followed those two young girls about the Marlowe's area, and I wondered who else he had followed about that evening. You've got an e-fit of him. How satisfied are you with the description? I think it's a very good description. He's described as white, 20 to 26 years of age, about 6 foot 2 inches tall, with short dark hair which was gelled back, a gaunt face and a long nose that had been broken at some stage and he was wearing a dark three-quarter length woolen overcoat. Now you want other people who have been intimidated, frightened by him, maybe even attacked by him to ring, but there's one man in particular we appealed for on that reconstruction, the chap in the, in the woolly hat who he approached for a light or something like that. Now this man is just a witness, you want to make that plain? Yes, absolutely. Just an important witness. He's first seen at 11.25 p.m. in the Marlows, and then he sits with the offender for a short time, having a cigarette and some sort of conversation. And he is just a witness, but a very important witness That's nonetheless. Right. Wednesday, the, the 19th of March, sitting on the wall there in the Marlows shopping centre. All right, thank you very much indeed. If there's any way that you can help, 0500 600 600. Please call here to the studio or the Hemel Hempstead CID on 01442 271 066. That's Hemel Hempstead 271 066.
Silver. Well, just to keep you up to date on the progress so far, we've had some promising calls on the rape in the Earls Court area of London. A prison officer called in with a name uh, for the e-fit that we showed. A student called also, uh, believing that she may have been another victim of the man. Five possible names have been put forward. Nicola Dixon murder. Five names have been put forward for the owner of a blue Ford Fiesta. Several possible sightings of the Fiesta in the area as well. Let's go back four years now to an appeal we did in February 1993. Claire Tiltman was a schoolgirl from Dartford in Kent who just finished her mock GCSEs and was going around to a friend's house about a mile from her own home. She was attacked in an alleyway and stabbed to death. Well, despite a good deal of help from Crime Watch viewers, the trail sadly went cold. But earlier this year, out of the blue, Claire's parents had a letter. And this is it. Now, it suggests the sender knows a lot about the murder. It's either a hideously cruel hoax or whoever wrote it really does want to help. If so, please get in touch if you wrote it. This letter on its own just isn't enough for police to go on. 0500 600 600 you can call us here in absolute confidence or ring the incident room if you prefer near canterbury and that's 01227 817 136 that's 01227 817 136 and there's a reappeal on another reconstruction too the murder of jackie gallagher from paisley she was working as a prostitute in glasgow she was last seen about two o'clock on the morning of monday the 24th of june some hours later, her body was found wrapped in a curtain at a lay-by on the A814 in Bowling. Well, now another witness has come forward who says that at about five past six on that morning, he saw a small red van parked near the lay-by and one of the rear doors was open. A man was standing nearby in bushes and seemed to be carrying what the witness thought looked like a light-coloured carpet. Now, the van had business markings and a phone number on the side. They were not sure what the number or markings were. Who was the driver? Could it have been you? If not, can you eliminate him? Might it be your van? Please call us straight away. Programme's live, 0500 600 600. As we've been saying, it's a free call number, 0500 600 600. Or try the instant room in Dumbarton, 01 389 822 163. That's 01 389 822 one six three. Well, now again, here's Superintendent David Hatcher. Now, last month we warned about a deception in which someone promises to get things on the cheap but disappears with your money. Well, here's a couple who may be able to help inquiries about people pulling the same trick. He's Derek George Redden, though he sometimes calls himself Derek Gittings. He's roughly five foot ten, big build, in his mid forties with short graying hair, and he's got a North of England accent. His partners, Carol Ann Jackson, though she takes on other names too, such as Carol Bartley and June Bartlett. She's in her mid-thirties, also heavy build, five foot six with shoulder length fair hair. They may have a white Peugeot 405 GL, that's white, registration J165RHP. Do give us a call if you know where they are, 0500 600 600 here, or Chelmsford on 01245 452 120. That's Chelmsford 452 120. In the early hours of Friday the 18th of April, a pub landlady was murdered in central London, and tonight there's a lot of new information that might, we hope, lead to her killer. Carol Fife was in her 30s. She came from Edinburgh, she became a beautician, a children's nanny, and then a successful publican. Well, here she is last Halloween in her pub. She ran the Prince Arthur. It's a busy local near London's Euston Station. About a month ago, on the night of Thursday the 17th of April, after she'd closed up and gone to bed, someone got into the building. Well, her killer made off with about £3,000, including charity cash collected for local pensioners. Detective Superintendent John Yates, this is a particularly senseless murder. It's generated a lot of publicity locally and nationally. You have some new information which you'd like the public to help you with tonight. Yes, there's a couple of areas that I'd like the public's assistance on. Um, we've identified a man, uh, a witness has come forward, who's been seen going through the first four floor fire escape of the pub at a particularly relevant time to our inquiry. Uh, we need to identify that who this man is and, and, if necessary, eliminate him from the inquiry. So someone saw him going in at around 11.30, something like around that? Around about 11.30, yes, yes. And you want to know if anybody saw him coming out, of course. Yes, of course, and the relevant times are any, any time between 1.30 a.m. on the Friday morning and 11 a.m. So, just to remind people, the fire escape is at the side and it's a spiral staircase, which it's is It's at just... the side of the pub and there's a spiral staircase leading into it, yes. What did he look like? 
He was around six foot tall. Uh, he was medium build. Uh, he had a roundish face, although he wasn't fat. He wore his hair uh, long at the back, but behind his ears. And he was wearing sort of quite a distinctive orange jacket, rather like this. Yes, this it? isn't the, the exact jacket, but it's, uh, it's as near as replica as we can find, around about 80%. It's orange and shiny, and it's quite distinctive. Now, some items were missing, um, particularly a set of about a dozen keys, one looking like this. Yeah, that's actually a replica of the safe key. Um, that was on a key ring containing around about 12, 12 keys, and we haven't recovered that, and I'm very anxious to identify it. It's a most unusual key, mm. I think you'll agree. I should think somebody walking around with those in his pocket would be pretty distinctive, I yeah. should think. And uh, a bottle like this went missing. You'd certainly see if somebody was walking down the street carrying one of these. Yes, that bottle uh, contained uh, charity cash con uh, collected in the pub, but mostly, mostly in notes, but around about three or, four, three or five hundred pounds. Um, it's an unusual bottle, and I'm very anxious to trace that as well. So what you really want to do is to link the man with that description with items like these wearing a jacket like this. Exactly, yes. You have very significant forensic evidence, don't you? We have recovered significant forensic evidence, which will, of course, help eliminate people as well as hopefully convict them. Why would someone want to do that? I don't know. It, it's a, it is a senseless crime for, for £3,000, which is a paltry sum. Uh, Carol was well-liked, uh, um, ran a very successful pub, and it, it really is tragic. Well, John Yates, thank you very much indeed. We do hope that the information you provided tonight will lead to her killer. There is a big reward, and that's been put up by Carol's employers, Whitbread. It is, in fact, £20,000, many times more than the money that was stolen. So if that's going to swear you, perhaps that will. Now, if there's any way that you can help as a witness or because you've heard something on the grapevine, the number, as usual, 0500 600 600, or call the incident room at Albany Street on 0181 733 6218. That's 0181 733 6218. And now for two other wanted men, here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames. Yes, and both of them have been charged with serious sex offences, one of them involving children, and both have skipped bail. Patrick Rowe is 45, 6 foot 3, big build with a Dublin accent and used to live in Bristol. He might be employed as a labourer and has connections in the Lake District and London. 0500 600 600 if you want to call us here in the studio or call the local police on 0117 945 4554. That's Bristol 945 4554. Alexander, or Sandy Kemp, was born in Glasgow, lived in Inverness, and though he has glasses in this picture, he rarely wears them. He's 44, smallish and medium build with receding brown hair. He's wanted on warrant for an offence against a four year old. He was last seen in February in York, driving a blue Vauxhall Cavalier. 0500 600 600 or call the incident room on 01904 669 007. That's York 669 007. Well, her numbers and names are changing as we speak. Um, on the Nicola Dixon murder we've had six names given. Um, ten names have been given in connection with the London rape. Uh, prison officers have called as well, recognising, as they see it, the, the EFIT. Nine names have been given in the case of the Liverpool attack. Three names given on the Hemel Hempstead sex attack and the uh, credit card fraudster. Possible sightings, two names have been given. That's the man who's been seen all around the country perpetrating all those crimes. Names, numbers, details coming in as I speak. Well, as uh, far as crime is concerned, lightning does strike twice, as Nick's going to tell us. Yeah, in fact, what's called a repeat victimisation is actually pretty common. If you've been burgled once, please take extra precautions. But burglary is one thing. What follows next is really extraordinary. It's a carbon copy armed robbery, exactly six months apart to the day, not just with the same villains, but the same victims. This is Southwick Street, leading into Southwick Square, just outside Hove in Sussex. On Friday, the 2nd of August, Securicor were delivering cash to Lloyd's Bank on the corner. It was a normal morning. I not had any delays or anything. The Lloyd's in Southwick Square was the sixth delivery of the morning, and we arrived there about 20 past 10. I got out, looked around as usual, didn't see anything suspicious. We're trying to be aware of activities around us and always to be on the lookout.
As I was walking away from the bank, a vehicle screeched up. Uh, the door was thrust open and a masked figure jumped out, brandishing a gun and ran towards the bank door. Initially, I couldn't really believe it. I walked over to the car and looked through the front windscreen at the person in the car. He was a male, mid-40s, uh, dark hair, sallow complexion, looking very much what I would describe as a hard man. He made no effort to cover his face in any way. I stood there for some five seconds, perhaps, staring at him. Come on! Come on! I think my main thought at the time was trying to impress a mental picture of the chap for driving the car and the car registration. I'd never been in that situation before, but I was convinced he was going to use the gun on me. I would never have expected it to happen again. What are you often? Yep. Eager beaver. <laughs> it was about six months later, and again a Friday. I met my colleague at the depot. It was my turn to sit in the rear of the van. We left about uh, 9.45. And this particular morning, I noticed a man in a dark blue transit type van. I thought it quite suspicious that he was there so long and wasn't doing anything. Um, as I was working, I kept my eye on him, thinking he was a workman, as he was dressed in a fluorescent jacket and he looked like he was an outdoor sort of person with a tan complexion, about 50, with greying hair and of quite a large build. And I thought, well, this workman is taking a long time to start working. I wonder what he's going to do. We got to the bank about quarter past ten. My driver went in with the money. It's my job to keep a lookout while he delivers it. But about 30 seconds later, I saw a man running towards the bank. I saw he had a pistol in his hand. I followed the normal procedure and activated the alarm. From Croft Avenue, the Stoden Escort sped over the recreation ground towards the Ada Bowling Club. My last job of the day is to clean the windows of the outside doors. This job is done last, otherwise people put their fingers on it and it, it stays dirty. There was a screech of brakes. Two men got out. They were both of very stocky build. One ran off towards the direction of the leisure centre. The other one walked towards me. He was about six foot tall, very big build, in his early 20s, with a big round face and short spiky hair. He was tanned as if he perhaps worked outdoors. He definitely had keys, so I assumed he was the driver. At this point, the vehicle screeched away and it was apparent to me then that there had been some sort of incident. The P registration dark blue Ford Transit was last seen heading north on Old Barn Way. David Gaylor, I gather you've got pretty much all the witnesses you need, so who are you appealing to tonight? We're actually appealing to people who may mix in the same circles as the robbers themselves. There is a large reward of £10,000 that's been offered, and we're hoping that someone will be tempted and come for them and give us the names of those responsible. All right, the reward is more than the robbery. So, if people are going to put bits of a jigsaw puzzle together, tell us the, the most important bits of the puzzle. 
We've concentrated our inquiries so far in the South Essex and North Kent area of the southeast of England. The reason for that is that the vehicles are connected to that area. The first vehicle that was used was a maroon Ford Escort and that was stolen from Essex and that had been stolen three years before the first robbery. The second uh, vehicle that was used was a blue Ford Escort and that was stolen two years before the second robbery and that was stolen from North Kent. So these vehicles have been stored for two and three years. This is a, a group of people who either got a garage business, they've got friends who can store cars, they've got a place under the arches, I and mean, that's a long time to keep a stolen vehicle. It is a long time, it's very unusual, and we'd like to hear from people who may know where those vehicles have been stored in this time. Now, we've got pretty good descriptions and efits of the drivers, or is it the one driver? We think it's probably the same driver, although the ages differ slightly, we think it's the same driver. The description given on the first driver is a male in his uh, early 40s, he's white, he's heavy bald, with a big fat face, with dark sweat backed hair. The second description of the getaway driver is again a white male, heavy build, this time a little bit younger, late 20s, and again dark hair that this time has been described as spiky, but we believe that's the same man. Perhaps the most important piece of the puzzle, if you're right about this, is your hunch that they still own, it's their vehicle, the P-registered blue van. Yes, that vehicle turned up a couple of hours before the robbery uh, was committed uh, and waited for the other people who committed the robbery to come back. We believe that's still in their possession and we'd be interested to hear from anybody who may be able to tell us the whereabouts of that vehicle. It's a dark blue Ford Transit van with a P registration. Mr. Gator, thank you very much indeed. Let me stress that security arrangements at the bank have now been changed. This will not happen a third time. Thank heavens. 0500 600 600. If you've any evidence, if you want to try and claim that reward, or you can call the instant room on 0127. 763-665-719. That's 01-273-665-719. And that's all for this month. Our lines are open here until midnight and you'll find other numbers listed under CFAX on page 621. Now, if you have a computer and a modem, you can reach us at crimewatchuk at bbc. That's cwuk at bbc.co.uk. And if you have any information on a crime we haven't covered, Try Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 Crime Stoppers 0800 555 We'll be back at 11.45, we hope, as we say, with some results. That's Crime Watch Update at a quarter to 12, rather late, and if it's beyond your bedtime, well, we'll be back next month on Tuesday the 10th of June. But before that, in fact, next week, there's a one-off special. It's called Crime Watch Hot Property, where we hope you'll identify stolen valuables and hopefully reclaim your lost treasures. That's Crime Watch Hot Property, BBC One, on Wednesday, the 21st of May, at 7 in the evening. Meanwhile, though tonight, of course, we've drawn together some pretty nasty crimes. We hope, as I was saying, we're now on the way to solving them. So don't have nightmares. Please, sleep well. Good night. Good night.